So if I tell you that four plus two I is a zero, then then there's something else going through your head. There's other information that's out there that I have not told you that must be true. What else must be true? Okay, so com complex zeros come in pairs and conjugate pairs. So if four plus two I is a zero, then four minus two I is a zero. So then we could write a couple of factors for this. And if we're looking for a standard form, then we're going to have to multiply those factors together. Let's go ahead and write our factors, though. So what would be my factor be for 4 plus 2i? Minus 4 minus 2i. And then minus four plus two i. All right, so I think in the video that I left for you guys on Tuesday, I used some shortcuts. I want you all to try this a couple different ways though, because some people like the shortcuts and, and I'll be honest with you, if I can get you comfortable with some of these um, arithmetic shortcuts, it's gonna make our life easier when we get into trig stuff in second semester. Um, but I know for some, some, some folks aren't such a big fan of shortcuts. So let's, let's do this twice. Let's do it once the long way, and then let's do it once with shortcuts. So the long way would be to actually multiply this thing out. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. I've shown you guys that and I've told you that I like the whole table method because it keeps me organized. So let's try it this way. This is a viable option. I'll go ahead and fill out. This is just a this is just a high school version of those times tables that you did back in elementary school. All right, and when we end up with those i squareds, I like to I like to rewrite them. I squared is remind me what's i squared again? Negative one and negative four i squared would be negative four times negative one, which is just a four. Um, so if you do it this way, one of the nice things about one of the pros of doing it this way is you're going to get stuff that cancels. You're always going to get stuff that cancels. That's why the shortcut exists. We got a positive 2i and a negative 2i. I got a negative 8i and a positive 8i. And if we put everything else together, we're going to end up with an x squared. We got negative 8x. That 16 and that 4 come together to give us a 20. The 8i's cancel. The 8i and the negative 8i do. All right, so let's do this again, same thing, but this time we're gonna use some shortcuts. So I'm gonna just copy this over again. So we've learned a couple of shortcuts. One of the shortcuts we've learned is that if I multiply two or if I multiply complex conjugates together, we get something that has no imaginary part anymore. A squared plus B squared. And when I look at these two factors, I see a couple of complex conjugates. Are you seeing some complex conjugates? 
when I look at this, I see that both of these have an X minus four in it. And that part does not have any imaginary piece to it. So I'm thinking of A as X minus four. And what's B gonna be? B is just two. So if with this shortcut, the B is just the coefficient on the I. So I could simplify this by doing a squared plus b squared. So a squared would be x minus four quantity squared. b squared would be two squared. We've got another shortcut that helps us deal with squaring a binomial. This is the one that you really, really, really wanna be comfortable with. It's gonna save you whole seconds of your life. Um, do you guys remember that one? Um, a, a plus B quantity squared is equal to, oh, good. All right. So if we apply that to this one, in this case, my A is X and my B is negative four. We're gonna end up with X squared minus two times negative four times X would be negative eight X plus 16, and then plus two squared was four. Put all that together, we get the same thing that we had just a second ago. So I have a, a question for you. It's, this is, and I'm just looking for gut instinct, and this is a curiosity. Um, if you were going to be doing something like this on an assessment, which of those two methods would you use? Would you use, would you just go ahead and multiply it out? Or would you go for shortcuts, just out of curiosity? So how many people would, would be like, you know what, I'm just going to multiply it out. It's a nice table, safe, easy. I know some stuff's going to cancel. Who's going to go, I'm going to go shortcuts because maybe it's a little, a little bit faster and it's it can do more work in my head. Okay. Okay. So it's to, it's entirely up to you, folks. You got you to strike a balance um, in this course and in mathematics in general between Accuracy is super important, but when it comes down to it, we can't be spending hours and hours and hours doing problems. So we want to be efficient as well. Can you guys put those phones away, please? Thank you. I got two for the price of one there. Awesome. Thanks. All right. So uh, pick your method and, and tell me what this one's going to be. So we'll do the same thing. I'm giving you one of the zeros. You're going to find me another zero. Turn it into a couple factors and multiply them together. Whichever method you'd like. Okay, and I want you to work this on your own, but I'm going to be quietly working it up here. So if you need a hint, feel free to look. Try and do as much as you can on your own, though. Did you do a different problem? That's okay. Did you do it right? Okay, that's all right. <laughs> All right. I would encourage you when you run into this in your assignment for today, and you will run into it on a couple different problems, try it, try doing, try doing at least one problem each way. Solidify that strategy that you've got in your head about how we're going to deal with this. 
this is this is arithmetic. It's just it's messy arithmetic. Um, there's a lot of room for uh, making mistakes. Um, if you are using shortcuts, I'm okay with. I, I don't want you to. I don't want to see you go straight from here to here. But show me this middle step. So when I did it, I used the shortcuts and I just kind of mentally grouped the x plus one together and then I squared x plus one squareds right here. And here's my five squared. So at least show me that intermediate step if you are going to use shortcuts. This would be like the minimum amount of work that I think I would accept on a on an assessment for something like this. All right, we ready to move on, folks? Big targets for today. Um, we want to be breaking apart polynomials um, with to find zeros, and we're going to be dealing with some some complex zeros this time around. So our first example, um, and you don't need the uh, you don't need to write the instructions up there because we'll put the instructions, we'll build that into our answer. And our first example, we're gonna try this without technology. Okay, so we are not going to use um, sort of the standard or method that we have been using because in this problem, they've given us more than just a polynomial. They've given us a, a pretty big hint about the answer to this question. So they gave us polynomial. It's a fourth degree polynomial. What does the fundamental theorem of algebra tell us about the zeros for this polynomial? There are going to be four of them. Um, and what does the complex conjugate zeros theorem tell us? If there's one complex zero, then there's got to be another one. What's what's the other one they didn't explicitly tell us? So two minus three i is also a zero. We know we're gonna end up with four of them all together and we're halfway there. Hey, nice. Okay. Um, we are going to write a linear factorization for this thing, so we can go ahead and get that started. I'm actually going to go, yeah, we'll, we'll save some space for it here. So let's start writing our answer zeros. We know there are four. We know we've got two plus three i and two minus three i. And let's start writing our linear factorization. F of X equals, can you tell me what two of our factors have to be? Two of our linear factors. You know what, that doesn't line up. I forgot to flip my sign there. That's why they invented the correction tape. But we know that there are going to be two more linear factors. And they could be repeated, right? But we'll go ahead and write it. I will leave a space for it there. So if we don't have access to a calculator, start looking for those other two. First of all, are we guaranteed to even be able to see anything on the calculator for those other two? Not necessarily. Could these other two also be complex zeros? They could be. We don't know for sure. So what can we use? What other tools do we have available to us? Yeah, could multiply it out. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead and do that. So you're saying, why don't we go ahead and turn this into a quadratic factor? It would be a quadratic. If I multiply two first degree polynomials together, we're gonna get a second degree polynomial. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So using the method of your choice, Go ahead and multiply those out.
hold on just a second. Let's let's give everybody a chance to to get their two multiplied out. So we've taken two linear factors, we multiplied them together to get a quadratic factor. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking backwards. What if what if I had a quadratic factor for these two also? We would be able to split it up into two linear factors. We got a couple tools we could use that for that. Maybe factoring, and if factoring fails, what would be our fallback? The old quadratic formula. So it'd be really cool, wouldn't it, if we could figure out what the quadratic factor was that contained these two linear factors. And you had an idea about how we might do that. And what were you going to say? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, I like that. That's fantastic. Do you guys hear that? All right. So, so show me our end behavior for this polynomial. Show me our end behavior. It's going to look like that, right? What's our y-intercept? Negative thirty-nine. So, if the y-intercept is negative, and we know that it's going to be going heading towards positive infinity on both sides, then then we're going to have to have a couple of x or x-intercepts, right? Specifically, what can you tell me about those two x-intercepts? What about the signs on those two x-intercepts? One's going to have to be positive and one's going to have to be negative, maybe, right? Oh, I like that. That's fantastic. So we have an x-intercept here, right? Negative. We've got an end behavior and we've got an end behavior. At some point over here in the positive x's, we're going to have to cross. And at some point over here, we're going to have to cross also. So without... Without doing any extra work, we've figured out not only do we have two other zeros, they're both going to be real. And one's going to be positive and one's going to be negative. That's fantastic. Thank you for that. All right. So um, coming back to here, I'm sorry, adding on to that or? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So so if we had access to a P o or to our calculator, we could use our P over Q list. Um, to try and find those two real zeros. Now, are we guaranteed to see? Because what could those? They could be real zeros, but they could be, they could be irrational. They may not show up on the p over q list. All right. So, how are we going to find this? It would be great if we had this quadratic factor. What if we took in? You said long division. If we took our original polynomial, divided out this quadratic factor, that would leave us with this other one. And that's going to be our next step. So we are going to do a little long division here. We've been practicing it since the beginning of the year. I think that was the first thing we did on day one, wasn't it? Long division. So let's, let's do it. We're going to divide out this x squared minus 4x plus 13 from our original polynomial. Should we have a race? No, okay. <laughs> no, slow and steady with these, remember? Strike that perfect balance between accuracy and efficiency. I am going to double check and make sure I didn't accidentally write one of these things down wrong. I've been burned by that mistake way too many times. All right, we're good. Take a couple minutes and do this here. Nope. Hey, pause for a second. Tell me about our remainder that we're going to get when we finish this up. Why should our remainder be zero? We're dividing something out that we know is a factor, so the remainder should be zero, right? So, so if I get something other than a zero, I'm going to be a little concerned.
Bless you. All right. Are we happy? I'm happy. I made a couple mistakes. If you were watching me there, I made a couple mistakes. I had negative 8x to the third here. And I was like, wait a second. I got to remember that when we're doing the subtraction step, that we tend to make mistakes. So double check. Half of being a good mathematician is knowing where those mistakes happen and giving yourself a chance to correct them before you move on. I don't know if it's half, but some percentage. All right. I found uh, x squared minus 3. Is that what you guys came up with? X squared minus 3. And that's a quadratic. I was kind of expecting a trinomial, but that's all right. It is a quadratic. So that is my other factor. That's my other quadratic factor. And we should be able to split that into two linear factors. Uh, it could potentially help us to do that if we go ahead and find our other two zeros. So this is important, folks. Can I get your attention up here, please? Our first two zeros gave us this quadratic factor right here. The other two zeros are going to come from my other quadratic factor, right? How do we use a factor to find a zero? Set it equal to zero and solve it. So someplace where you got a little bit of space, I'll do mine right off the side here. X squared minus three is equal to zero. And we'll solve this. I think many of us will probably end up adding three to both sides and taking a square root. What do we want to make sure we do when we take a square root on both sides? Don't forget that plus or minus. I don't know what's going on. So we have found our other two zeros. Root three and negative root three. And now we're ready to write our other two factors, x minus root 3 and x plus root 3. All right, we were able to accomplish that entirely without technology. Does this work with, when you say normal functions, are you talk, do you mean like ones that only have real zeros? Yeah, so the thing that allowed us to do this without technology was what? What's 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 the what's the key thing that allowed us to do this without looking at our guy? We get they gave us one they gave us a zero. So they gave us a starting point on this one. And and they gave us one zero, which allowed us to find two. So we were already halfway to the solution without actually doing any work. So that's what allowed us to do it without the technology. Um and we've talked about how the other method, which we're going to do next, we, we could technically do that without technology. It's just a tedious process with that P over Q list. So we're just making it a little easier on ourselves by using the technology. Yeah. From here to here, you know what? We're gonna have some time here in a minute, and and let me let me pull up next to you, and we'll we'll kind of work through one together. Yeah. Um. So so you are you trying to do it with the shortcuts? Okay. Um. So until we get you good and comfortable with that, which we'll practice and get you there, you know your fallback plan, right? We could always do it the long way. Um. But yeah, let me let me work with you individually on that when we get a when we get a minute here. All right, one more, folks. I want to give you a chance to actually start on the assignment and tackle some of these problems today. So we're going to do one more together, maybe, if I can find it. All right. Um, you do not want to write down all of these instructions because, again, we'll build them into our final answer. So I'm just going to show you the, the polynomial. Copy this down. We're going, to, we're going to find all our zeros, and we're going to factor this in a couple different ways. This time... We're not given any extra information, so 
Um, we will be utilizing our technology for this one. It is possible to do this problem entirely without technology. We'll talk about that as well. Remember that just in case you ever find yourself on a desert island and you need to factor some polynomials, you won't have your calculator with you. Um, but for this problem, let's go ahead and simplify that process a little bit by using our calculators. We have these tools available to us, so let's use them. So there are three, three different answers that we're gonna give for this. So let's go ahead and get those answers set up. Um, or uh, one of them is we're going to find all of our zeros. So we should be able at this point to anticipate how many zeros we're going to have. This is a fourth degree polynomial. So we know that we're going to have four zeros. Um, is there anything that we can deduce, deduce about those zeros? I love what you did last time. I want to think about that for this one. Um, what's the end behavior of this function going to look like on both sides? And what's our y-intercept? Positive 15. So would it be possible for us to be going up on both sides and have a y-intercept that's positive and never touch the x-axis? Is that possible? And this one, it, it is possible that we don't touch the x-axis at all. If we do touch the x-axis, what would that have to look like? If I did touch the axis somewhere between here and here, we would have to go past it and come back. Or, or we could bounce off of it, right? So if I do have uh, intercepts over here. If I do have a negative real zero, I'm going to have to have two negative real zeros. It could potentially be one that's been repeated. But we could have all imaginary zeros for this one. It's entirely possible. Um, all right. I wouldn't give you a problem like that, though, because we would have some trouble proceeding past there. So, all right. Um, and then we're also going to factor. We're going to do two different types of factoring. We're going to do a linear factorization is going to be f of x equals, and we're going to have how many factors if we do a linear factorization? How many factors are we going to have? Four. One for each of our zeros. So we'll go ahead and get this one set up. And then if applicable, wink, wink, we are also going to do a factorization as a product of linear and irreducible quadratic factors. And I'll just leave a space for that. Product of linear and irreducible quadratic factors. Basically, that means if we do end up with any complex zeros, we're going to take those complex linear factors and combine them together into a quadratic factor. And this is section 2.5. So I'm guessing we'll probably have some complex. That's not a mathematical, more of a psychological deduction. All right, we'll come back to that. So um, when we were doing problems like this in section 2.4, what was our first go-to strategy? Let's graph it. We got these graphing calculators. If we end up seeing some, what are we going to focus on on these graphs? We're going we're gonna to look at our x-intercepts. We'll be looking at the x-axis. And hopefully we'll be able to find some... zeros from that.
Hey, there's one. There's another one. Oh, cool. All right. So since this is our notes, I think it's probably a good idea if we make just a quick rough sketch of what this looks like. Man, that looks like it might be at three. How can we confirm that? So we could either go to our table. I like second calc value. Type in three. What am I hoping my Y coordinate comes up to be? Three comma zero. All right. Yeah, that's great. So there we go. We got one of our zeros. It's three. And there's another kind of betweener one between uh, zero and one someplace. What a great idea. Yeah, why don't we use our P over Q list and see if we can find a potential rational zero between zero and one. Let's go ahead and build that P over Q list. The constant is gonna be your P. And then the lead coefficient is your Q. So our P list is going to be all the factors of 15. One, not two, three words, not four, five, 15. And our Q list is one, two, and four. Now, if we were stuck on a desert island and we didn't have access to our graphing calculator, that would be the first thing we did, right? And we would just start grinding through those different combinations and see what we could find. Um, there are some other tricks that we could use to kind of simplify that process. Um, but since we do have access to our graphing calculator, we found one of them already. We know that there's another one between one and four. So give me some fractions I could make out of these two lists. I'm sorry, between one and zero and one. Sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> zero between zero and one. <laughs> Give me a fraction. One or four is one possibility. What other possibilities are there? Three over four, one over two. Um, yeah, so let's try a couple of those. I don't know. Let's maybe try one fourth first. I spoiled that. Sorry, folks. Yeah, don't ever talk to me about movies that just came out. <laughs> All right, so I sorry I spoiled that for you. Yes, one over four does does end up working. So <laughs> if one over four had not worked, I would try one over two. That's also between zero and one. I would also try three over four. But we got it. So that's good because this is making me feel good now because what I know is that I should be able to divide out these two factors. And since they're both linear, we can use synthetic division for this. Folks, let me get your attention here. Um, and if I divide these two things out, that's gonna take me from a fourth degree polynomial down to what? Second degree polynomial, and we can deal with secondary polynomials. Now, hopefully we'll be able to, to factor that thing, but I got a feeling we won't because I'm pretty sure at this point, these are gonna be imaginary zeros, right? So, so if we can't factor them, good old fallback is, quadratic formula. So let's do the that piece now. Um, you can divide these out in any order that you want. What do you guys want to start with? The three or the one fourth? Three. I think it's a good idea to start with ones that might be a little bit easier first. My, and my polynomial coefficients were four, negative 25, 62, negative 74, and 15. And for those who are going to end up working ahead, could I get you to look up here really quickly? When we do this, after I get my depressed polynomial here, I'm just going to go ahead and stick a one fourth out here, and then I'm going to divide that right out of the depressed polynomial. So we're going to end up having, it's not sad, it's just smaller. We're going to end up having something that looks like this. Double-decker synthetic division. Well, good. good. <laughs> hmm. 
Uh oh. What did I do wrong here? That's because that's not sixty nine. That's thirty nine. There we go. Hey, all right. Is all right. In whatever order you want, I usually do the division first. So if you get down to there, if you're still working, that's fine. We're gonna we're not gonna leave you behind. If you do get down to there, my recommendation is go ahead and write out that new quadratic factor, set it equal to zero and solve it. And pro move here. If you can divide something on both sides to give yourself some easier, smaller numbers to put in your quadratic formula, go ahead and do that. Because then your quadratic formula work will be a little bit simpler. Uh, that's a typo. Thank you. We're good now. Put their coefficients in there. I I'm I'm doing standard form standard form for complex numbers the i is separate. There's a coefficient, there's a real coefficient in front of it, and then the i is separate. You could write the i out in front of the, the radical here on top. That's technically correct. You, it, the i could be in the numerator of this fraction instead. It would be outside of the radical, not in the radical. All right, hey folks, if you are finished, if you're caught up with me, just let's, let's, uh, Pause on the side conversation so those who are still working can focus and get their last couple zeros as well. It's giving us the zeros. And there's two of them there, right? Yeah, yeah. So when you write it, like, it's not going to be the 
Yes, and we're about to go back and do that in a moment. Does, can, can you guys give me the universal sign if you need a moment? Anybody need a moment before we go? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back up further up the page so you're not going to be able to see this, but we're going to transfer this information back up to where we started our, our final answer at the top here. So if you haven't already, let's go ahead and put our last two zeros in here. We just came up using quadratic formula with 3 over 2 plus root 11 over 2i and 3 over 2 minus root 11 over 2i. We are now ready to write our linear factorization. So now that we have all of our zeros, we can turn those into factors. The signs basically are gonna get reversed here. And before we move on from this, as soon as you get this written down, I want you to pause and make sure that it is going to match our original function. <clears throat> so what I can tell you is that we have written a function. I have written a function that has zeros at the exact same places as my original function. But I don't know that I've gotten my vertical stretch the same as the original. So what do I need to do? So there, there, there are different ways I could write this. Absolutely. Yes. So, so you suggested writing this as 4x minus 1. That absolutely you could. Okay. I can write it this way, or I could write it as 4x minus 1. Um, I could write this as 2x minus 3 minus root 11i also. So there's, there's different ways I could write a couple of these different factors. What we got to be careful of is does the function that we wrote match the function that we started with? So I always look at the lead term here. We want to see a 4x to the fourth in our final version. In the version that I wrote, my lead term would be x times x times x times x. So I've got the x to the fourth, but I'm missing that factor of 4 in front. So in my version, I'm just going to pop a 4 out front here to match that. Now, in your version, if you wrote this as 4x minus 1 instead, would you need to have that 4 out there? You wouldn't because you would have taken care of it. If I had written this as 4x minus 1 and, I, and I'd had a 2x in front of both of these, if I'd rewritten these so that they didn't have fractions, then I might have to have a fractional coefficient in front of this thing. So we got to check and make sure it matches. All right, let's go ahead and write this other version. So these two factors are linear factors and they don't have um, any imaginary part. In this other version, we're gonna combine these two things together into a quadratic factor. So I'm gonna leave the four off for right now. And I'm still using X minus one fourth. Again, you're free to use four X minus one. That would still have the correct zero. And what was the quadratic factor that we used to come up with these two imaginary or complex zeros? You did you did you say the four x squared version or the x squared version? You said the x squared version, x squared. So we had two different versions. Both of these factors would have those two zeros, so we could use either one that we wanted to. So I'm going to go ahead and use the simpler one. But then I'll ask myself that question again: Do I need to modify? Um with a coefficient to get us to match our original. And I think for mine, I do. I see x times x times x squared. That would just give me x to the fourth. I'm gonna need a four in front of this as well. If we had used the version of this that had the four x squared minus 12 x plus 20, then I would not need that four there. Question? Absolutely. So we've got we've got four here. We could we could split it into two and two. And sometimes you will see answers where they will um, try to avoid any fractions at all inside the factors. So I could multiply these two factors both by two. That would get rid of all my fact all my fractions in here, and I have a two x there. 
but then I'd have to divide this by two twice. I could multiply this one by four, but then I'd have to divide this by four. Yeah, in fact, we could do the four in both the twos and we could put another coefficient out front here. It would be a one fourth, right? Basically, anything that I multiply into one of these factors, I just need to divide this, this lead factor by, right? Yep, so, so keep that in mind because uh, as you're working your problems, remember, you might see a different version of an answer in the back of your textbook if you're doing an odd numbered problem. Ask yourself, is this just another version of the same answer? All right, now let's talk about uh, assessment strategies. So we've got a problem like this on the on an assessment, say on our chapter test. Um, we don't have an odd number to answer to, to flip to the back of the textbook to check here. So what's our strategy here? How what are we going to do to make sure that we didn't make any any mistakes? What would you suggest? We could graph both of them. When you say both of them, the original and which factored version. We're going to have to do the one with the calculators. My calculator at least won't handle um, graphing with any imaginary parts to it. So we'd have to graph this one and the original one. And if I did that and I'm seeing the exact same graph, then I'd be feeling pretty confident about it. The only thing that I wouldn't be sure of is, did I get these imaginary, or these complex zeros right? In which case I would probably just want to go back and just double check my work on my quadratic formula. All right, questions? Right, right. We know that in our original, in our original function, that the lead term had a had a multiple of four in the front, a coefficient of four. We need to make sure that happens with these ones as well. Um, I don't know about glaringly apparent. That's kind of a <laughs> that's a subjective word, but but yeah, I mean, what you want to do is you just want to you want to look at your lead terms in each of your factors. If you multiply those lead terms in each factor together, you should end up with the lead term in your original polynomial. Along, okay, I'm, let me restate that. If I multiply my coefficient in each of these lead terms together, I should end up with the same lead term that I had in my original. And if it's not, then change your coefficient so that it matches. You guys are asking great questions. Any other questions? We've got not a huge chunk of time. So let me give you the assignment. Um, my recommendation for this assignment is that you start with 33 and then do 29. We've got a little bit of time right now. It'd be awesome if you guys could actually get a start on number 33 right now. 33 is gonna be very similar to the problem, uh, not this example, the one that we did previous to that. 29 is gonna be a lot like this one. So if I were working these assignments, I would be I would be starting with those two problems. Remember, I don't care if your assignment problems are out of order. Um, I have a couple individual questions to get around to, so I am not certain that I will have time to check assignments. I know that I owe you guys points for two assignments at this point. Um, if I don't get a chance today, then I'll, I'll have to check next time. We do have a mid-unit review coming up. I'm not sure if that's our next class or not. I'll have to look. All right, folks, thank you for your attention. I'm gonna get around and, and try and answer some of those individual questions at this point.